Second Chronicles 23. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and took the captains of hundreds, Azariah the son of Jehoram, and Ishmael the son of Jehanan, and Azariah the son of Obed, and Mashiach the son of Adiah, and Elishaphat the son of Zachariah, into covenant with him. Now what he's doing is, he's getting the top men of Israel, or Judah, this is, this is talking about the southern tribes, Judah, is he's going to take control of the nation, but there's a problem. you got Athila who's running the nation now. She has murdered those who would be king, those who would be in charge, and remember that this, this young man was taken by his uh, sister Jehoshaphat and hidden like Moses this time for six years. Now he's come up and he's going to take control. And he needs the people of Israel. He needs to do it right. He, need, he can't do it himself because uh, if he did, it looked like it'd be uh, something that goes on down in South America. A military overthrow of the government. And when and they went about in Judah and gathered the Levites. All right, you're going to get God's people involved. You're going to get the Levites because what they're going to do is God approve, is God right? Out of all the cities of Judah and the chief of the fathers of Israel. Okay, you got the Levites and you got the heads of the tribes of, of Judah, and they came to Jerusalem. This is where the temple is. This is where the temple has been closed. This is where uh, Jehoiada has been staying. I mean, Joash has been staying. As we read, read in the last chapter, he's been living in the, in the temple. He's been trained by the Levites, as we see in Samuel. Meanwhile, like, like uh, Eli, who's got a messed up family, has got a messed up service, and you see that in the Well, you're almost going to see something like that with the Antichrist. As he reigns in the land, as he takes control, and there's going to be two men, Moses and Elijah, running around and doing the work of God. And all the congregation made a covenant with the king in the house of God. So they're at the temple. And he said unto them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. Athaliah is not a man, first of all. She's not of David, second of all. And she's not approved of God, third of all. This young man is. This is the thing that ye shall do. Okay. A third part, there's that three again. Threes are an interesting number in the Bible. A third part shall be at the king's house. This is where he lives. Third part of the army. A third part that gave the foundation. And all the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. But let none come into the house of the Lord. Now what's going on here, they're going to set up the king, but there are enemies in the land. You don't, they don't want to be charged with killing anybody by murder. They want to make sure that everything they do now protects the king, protects the people, and only those that, that are the outlaws are put under crime and punished. Satan has almost destroyed the line of David outside of one boy. They are also protecting this king because they realize if, they, if this king gets killed, that's it. Judah is gone, wiped out in the pages of history. But let none come into the king's, excuse me, let none come into the house of the Lord. Save the priests. They're the only ones that belong there. And they that minister the Levites. Remember, all priests are Levites, but all Levites are not priests. There were Levites that went and did things in the temple, even though they weren't priests. 
They had duties. They had charges. They just weren't in charge of the things that were of God. And dedicated for God. Like the offerings and the blood. For they are holy. So right there is telling us. Just because they were Levites didn't mean you left them out. They were just as holy as the priests. They had to be to be working in a temple. How do you know John the Baptist's father did right? He was able to go into the excuse me. He was able to go into the holy place and come out alive. And a Levite shall come past this king round about. That means encircle. Every man with his weapon in his hand. This is this is ours today. This would be your secret service protecting the president of the United States. I mean, are we supposed to live by faith? Well, here's a secret service. Here's an armed guard protecting the king in Judah who's going to do right by God. And whosoever else cometh into the house, he shall be put to death. So the orders are only the king and his and the Levites and the priests and these soldiers are allowed. Anybody else gets put to death. No one has any business to be with the king. Because what's going to happen? What the next thing is is coming up. But be ye with the king when he cometh in and when he goeth out. Wherever that king goes, those soldiers are to be there. Surrounding him. Protecting him. Listen, uh, Abner didn't even protect uh, King Saul. Twice. When David and his man came up and David cut the spirit off Saul one time. And the second time he went and grabbed the spear and the bolster of water. And he cries out to Abner, you know, you're worthy of death. We, uh, what's going on? Someone came into the king tonight and they wanted to do mischief to him. And look where his spear and his bolster are. So the Levites and all of Judah did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest had commanded. Now notice how Jehoiada is taking command. He's the priest. He's over Joash. Why? Joash is not king yet. Guess who's been taking care of Joash? Jehoiada. Guess who's been teaching Joash, the high priest? Guess who's been showing jo uh, Joash what to do and how to do? Jehoiada. Here's a king that has been guided by the priest. And took every man, his men, that were to come in on the Sabbath with them, that were to go out on the Sabbath. And Jehoiada the priest dismissed, not the courses. Everybody did what they were supposed to do. Even on the Sabbath. You know, they went after Jesus. They know oh, you're doing this on the Sabbath. You did this on the Sabbath. Listen, there were a lot of things that were done on the Sabbath. Especially by the priest. Every morning and every night, the lamb had to be offered. The showbread had to be put out. The wicks on the candle, candles had to be trimmed. The altar had to be taken, you know, tended to. The priests were working at the temple on the Sabbath. The eighth day, when, when a boy was to be circumcised. And Jesus said, now listen, if, if one of your animals falls in a ditch, and it's about to die, what are you going to do? Wait to, you know, Sunday to come along? No, he helped that animal out. So they're working on the Sabbath. Moreover, Jehoiada the priest delivered to the captives of hundreds spears and bucklers and shields that had been King David's, which were in the house, of, which were in the house of God. Now, isn't that an interesting thing? David had artillery in the house of God. There's a time when David is running from King Saul. He goes to the tabernacle. The king is there. He says, listen, you know, we're hungry. We're thirsty. We need something. And he gets the showbread. What else does he grab at the temple? Goliath's sword. David never forgot. 
But the problem is, when David was around, there was no temple. Solomon put that in there. David's artillery, Solomon put in that temple for a reason. And here, the, the, the priest is, now this is where the Roman Catholic Church gets, you know, we're the priest, we tell all the world who to fight and who not to fight. You know, Vietnam, Korea, and all those other places. Well, not when you're a wicked organization and worshiping Satan and not God of the Bible. But here, Jehoiada has got the law and he's doing what God told him to do. He's protecting the king. He's not, he's not giving him to, to provoke a fight. It's for protection. And he sent all the people, the, the, the priests. He's in charge. He's giving the orders. Uh, Joash doesn't have a military yet. Joash is not king. Joash is not ahead of the, the government. He's not ahead of the army. The priest has been. He said all the people, every man having his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, along by the altar and the temple, by the king round about. So they are in the courtroom of the temple. There is the brazen altar. Everyone can see. They're not in the holy place, and they're not in the most holy place. They're out in the open. And on both sides of that altar, there's armed men. Then they brought out the king's son. Brought him out from where? From the holy place. I would assume they got the front entrance all blocked. The people were out there. They made a covenant with the Lord. There's only one place they could have brought the king that they didn't know or was not been hiding is he's in the holy place. Had Israel received Jesus Christ their Messiah, it would have been great for him to go in that temple, rip that veil from top to bottom, go into the mercy seat, apply his blood, and would have been great for Jesus to come out of the temple and say, Okay, where's my throne? You ever think about that? Can you imagine the Jewish Messiah, had they received Jesus, come walking out of that temple and say, The blood's been applied. I'm the high priest. Rome, you fall down. That's my seat. You don't believe me? What's that over there? Looks we'll like the mercy seat. Uh huh. Can you look into the mercy seat? Well, something. Had they received Jesus Christ as their Messiah, Jesus would have gone through, deposited the blood, like the high priest would have done in the Day of Atonement, and then he would have walked right back out of the temple and said, it is finished. It is done. And Hebrews records that he is the high priest offering a sacrifice once for all. But Jesus had to show up to two men on the road to uh, Aramaeus. He had to show up to the women at the, at the, at the uh, tomb. He had to show up in the upper room when the disciples were hiding. Because the nation had rejected him. And in Acts chapter 1, he goes up. And Israel has not been the same since. So imagine, one day Jesus Christ is going to go in that millennial temple. He's going to do what he needs to do. And he's going to come out and David will be sitting as the prince of all over the land. Jesus Christ as the king over the land. And those Christians that, that are obtained who were worthy enough to have reigns of cities be reigning in the cities that they get. You want to talk about something fabulous. Never mind Solomon's temple. Never mind the temple that, that's built during Ezra and Nehemiah. Never mind the Roman temple that Herod built. Never mind the temple that the Antichrist is going to build. We're going to see that temple in Ezekiel is talking about built by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see Jesus Christ come out and sit as Joash will sit. King over the land. Athaliah will be put down 
as the Antichrist will be put down when Jesus comes. You know, they'll be cleaning the temple of all the filth because the Bible says the Antichrist will be there sitting in that spot proclaiming he is God of all gods. It's amazing. And they brought out the king's son and put upon him the crown. The Bible says he comes back with crowns on his head. And gave him the testimony. That is the law of Moses. You know he's been learning? He's been learning in the testimony by Jehoiada. The priest. He's probably even done what the law now is not recorded. Well, he's probably even made his own copy. Doesn't the, Old, doesn't the Testament, the Old Testament, the law says that a king was to write his own copy? I bet you he's studying. I bet you he read his own. It's not recorded. It's not even recorded that Solomon wrote his own copy. But yet he violated the law three times by going to Egypt. By wives. And by excessive money and gold and silver. And made him king. Now he's king. And Jedediah Je and his sons anointed him. Jedediah the priest and the priest his sons anoints him with oil. Like Samuel anointed David. Like Solomon's anointed with oil. Olive oil or oil olive. Type of the Holy Spirit. He is now the king of the land. And said, God save the king. And that's an English chant, which today is, you know, God save the queen. Because there is no king. Get out of the Bible. And look how wicked that nation is right now. 400 plus years in, the, you know, the King James Bible. And they're a wicked nation. You guys send missionaries over there to them and it amazes me. But you think America is so strong and so godly and all that, you're going to have to send missionaries to America pretty soon. You do know that in the book of Acts, they sent money to Jerusalem during a famine, I believe it was a famine, something like that. That the churches all around were sending money and relief to Jerusalem. I'm one of the nations around the world that we sent missionaries out. I wonder if they're going to return the favor to America when she falls. Or has America so fallen and so failed the missionaries with the polluted, perverted, watered down, uh, make me happy and make me feel good and entertain me God that goes out in the nations today. That when you send prophets into the land, like what happened in Israel, that the prophets were of, of Baal, the 400 prophets of Jezebel, and the people feared God and served other gods. Now when Athaliah heard the noise of the people, running and praising the king, she came to the people into the house of the Lord. She looked, and behold, the king stood at his pillar at the entering in. Now it's funny he stood at his pillar. Do you remember what the two pillars were called? Well, one of them was called Boaz. Who was that? Solomon's great great grandpa. He imagined I know I don't know. You can take this and throw this in the car. Can you just imagine Joe Ash leaning against Boaz and say, This is rightfully mine that God told David his sons will be here. To prove it, here's Boaz right here, a pillar. It says his pillar, and he didn't own the pillars. He didn't put them up. Only thing I can assume is that Boaz, as Solomon named it, from the family of David, that you find in Ruth chapter 4. And the princes and the trumpets by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and sounded the trumpets. As the singers with instruments of music. And that case is an extra spelling. The old English form. It's just as okay. Nothing wrong with it being there. And such as taught to sing praise. 
Then Athaliah rent her clothes and said, Treason, treason. She gets naked. She starts renting her clothes. I can tell you about some churches in California I heard about women renting their clothes. Jehoiada. No, we already got a king, but Jehoiada stands up. The priest. Why? He's the ambassador of God. God is speaking through him. Born out the captains of the hundreds that were sent over the house. See, now you've got two governments right now. Two governments. You got Athaliah who set herself up, and you got Joash who's been set up by God. You got a problem. You know what happens when you get an animal or, or a human that's born with two heads? It will die eventually. It does not live long. It's called a mutation. And stuff like that happens. It won't survive. So what you have is you have a godly king and you have a wicked queen set up. And the priest has got to stand in for God and tell the people who deserves that right, who needs to be there by the words of God. He said unto her, unto them, have her forth out. Them. Have her four of the ranges. So you call it a shooting range. Take her out. And whosoever follows her, let him be slain with the sword. Anybody that follows Athaliah, anybody who takes her side, you are to kill that person too. You're supposed to kill your sins. You're not supposed to let them follow you. Let, her, let him be slain with the sword. For the priest said, Slay her not in the house of the Lord. Take her out of the house and go and slay her not in the house of the Lord. You know, even Joab was killed in the house of the Lord holding on to the altar. And he killed two or three people in murder. But this priest, Jehoiada, he wants that temple clean. He wants a fresh start for this king. He's looking out for the nation. He said, don't you let that woman be here. Get her out of here and kill her. God is out because everything she's done has been against the law. And what she's done, the law says she's to be put to death. So they're obeying the law. Now, then Jehoiada priest brought out the captains of the hundreds that were set over the host. And said unto him, Have her forth without the ranges. Whosoever followed her, let him be slain with the sword. For the priest said, Slay her not in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her, that by force, she didn't go on her own will. And when she was come into the entering the house of the gate by the king's house, they slew her there. And Jehoiada made a covenant between him and between all the people, between the king, that they should be the Lord's people. They made a promise. And when you stand before a preacher, before anybody, and you're going to be a marriage vows to a husband, to a wife, you make a covenant between God as a Christian that we are going to serve the Lord together to death do his part, and anything other than that is a violation of a vow made to God. That's what he's doing here. We're going to make a vow to God to do right and to love the Lord with our heart and to do what God wants us to do. Then all the people went to the house of Baal and break it down and break his altars and his images in pieces. And slew Matin, the priest of Baal, before the altar. Well, look at that. The Baal had a house. He had altars. He had images. He had a priest. He had everything that the temple had by God. 
You know, churches have preachers. They have an altar. They have a place of worship. And it could be a house of Baal. Doesn't have to be necessary God's house. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 it says that Satan has preachers. Satan has a Jesus. Satan has a spirit. Satan has a gospel. You do get that. Just because it is said to be a house of God may not be a house of God. Now, do we destroy these places? All I'm going to say is look, look at what verse 17 says. Our Constitution allows you to worship any God you want to do. And you wonder why the Muslims are winning. Our Constitution says Muslims have a right to practice what they practice on our soil and you can't stop them. Our Constitution says that the Catholic Church has a right to say that that bread and wine is the literal blood and body of Jesus Christ which is carnivalism which violates John chapter 6 and violates scripture but our Constitution says they have a right to do that. Paul says that a man is to have one wife. But our Constitution allows a bunch of idiots to run around this country marrying multiple wives and taking wives that weren't even their wives who are other man's wives and let them settle in a state. Our Constitution says that people have a right to come to your door and tell you that Jesus Christ is not God. And they have right to do it by our Constitution. And our Constitution, no matter what it says, you take a street preacher who is serving God, you put him in jail, especially when he's preaching in the Chicago area or anywhere where Dearborn and all those other cities where Muslims are predominant and a mass by majority. And the Bible-believing Christian is put to jail. And then pretty soon preachers can't preach about sodomites because that would be hate literature and we'll have to put you in jail with a constitution that says we don't have a right to speak. Now you tell me. When was the last time on the television you heard a true Bible-believing preacher preach the truth out of the book without any restrictions? But we have a Constitution. We have a Constitution that says we have a right to free speech, but I can't call certain people certain names. I don't know. They destroyed the house and God started a revival. How many times have we read in Chronicles where they took the Baalites and they took the foreign houses, they took the, the gods, the G-O-D-S, they took their worship places and destroyed them and God came in and said, Let's, let me settle amongst you and let us have a good time together in fellowship. You know, Adam and Eve didn't have no place of foreign worship, didn't have no gods, worshiped the God of the Bible, and had perfect, sweet fellowship with God until they brought in Satan and the fellowship quit. Am I saying we should go destroy these churches? No, the law says not to. We're going to obey the powers that be. But I tell you one thing, if you wanted America to remain a Christian nation, you should have not ever written the, the Constitution to have freedom of religion. You should have said in the Constitution the freedom to preach and to live a Christian by Jesus Christ and the God of the Bible. Amen. Period. That's it. That's what should have been said in the Constitution. 
But the Constitution doesn't even mention God and doesn't even mention Jesus Christ. Let's get real. Also, Jehovah appointed the offices of the house of the Lord by the hand of the priests, the Levites, whom David had distributed in the house of the Lord to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord. As it is written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and with singing, as it was ordained by David. So what they're doing is they're setting things up by, by God. They're setting things up by David because David had a heart after God. God allowed David to do many things. God even took the deadliest sin that would have put you in hell, adultery and murder. God forgave him for that and gave him a promise that your sons are going to forever sin in Jerusalem as kings and Jesus Christ come from the line of David so they are setting everything up by what David did and by the law which does not contradict each other because all David did was put in singing and praising and instruments I wonder how far you were from Jerusalem during the right times of Jerusalem and you could hear the music playing for the Lord. I wonder how far you could hear that. And he set the porters, those are, those, are, those are the doorkeepers. You find that in John chapter 10. At the gates of the house of the Lord, that none which was unclean in anything should enter in. Now look at that. We're not going to allow anybody who's wicked into the temple. Why? They've been desecrating it. They've been chopping the gold off the doors. They've been taking this and giving it to the, anybody who would take it. Jehoiada wants to keep the temple pure and clean. And he took the captains of hundreds and the nobles and the governors of the people and all the people of the land and brought down the king from the house of the Lord and they came through the high gate unto the king's house and set the king upon the throne of the kingdom. And all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was quiet, peace. After that, they had slain Athila with the sword. And wait till we get to the next chapter and the greatness of, jo of uh, Joash. And working with Jehoiada. But then again, the devil comes up when the revival happens. Jehoiada wants to keep everything clean. He wants to keep everything holy. He wants to do that which is right. And Joash, the king, is going to follow him. To make sure he stays in fellowship with God. And stay in fellowship by doing what the priest tells him to do. There's a lot going on.